Hello and welcome to storytelling number two. Uh, let, we're going to continue where we left off from number one. We're still reading, of course, Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, my name is Sky Breather, and let's continue. At home in the kitchen, even after bad days, Devi can get a little cheery. Drink some of Delwyn's white wine, fool around with Freya like a big sister. Freya doesn't have any brothers or sisters, so she can't be sure. But it, as she is already bigger than Devi, it feels to her like what she imagines having a sister would feel like. A sister who is littler, but older. Now Devi sits on the kitchen floor and under the sink, calls for <coughs> Badim to come join them and play spoons. Badim appears in the doorway looking pleased, holding the fat stick of big tarot cards. He sits and they split up the cards among them and begin each to build card houses at three corners of the floor that they always take. They build the card houses low and thick for defense against the other nefarious attacks. Adding cards at angles so there are no faces presented square to each other, Devi always makes hers like a boat turned upside down. And she, and as she usually wins, Badim and Freya have begun to imitate her style. When they are done building their card houses, they take turns flicking plastic spoon across the kitchen at each other's constructions. The rule is, you have to launch the spoon by bending it between your hands, then letting it loose to spring through the air end over end. The spoons are light, and their little bowls catch the air so that their flights are erratic, and only seldom do they hit their targets. So they flick, and the spoon arcs across the floor, veering this way and that, flick and miss, flick and miss. And then there will be a hit. Thwack! But if the afflicted card house has been built well and gets lucky, it will withstand the blow. Or only partly fall, losing an outer rampant, a bartizan. But Dim has found names for all these features, which makes Devi laugh. Every once in a while, a single hit will simply crumble a card house completely, which always makes them cry with surprise and then laugh. Although sometimes a kill shot causes a bad look to cross Debbie's face. But mostly she laughs with her husband and child and flicks the spoon when it's her turn. Her lips pursed in concentration. She leans back against the cabinets, wearily content. This, Badim and Freya can do for her. Okay, she is often angry. But she can shut that in a box inside her at times like this. And besides... Her anger is directed mostly at things outside Freya's ken. She isn't angry at Freya, and Freya does her best to keep it that way. Then one day, one of the printers breaks, and this puts Devi into an immediate fury of worry. No one sees it but Freya, as everyone is upset, scared, looking to Devi to make things right. So Devi hurries down to the print shop, dragging Freya along, talking on her headset and sometimes stopping mid-conversation to put her hand over the little mic in front of her mouth and curse sharply or say, wait just a second. Or so she can talk to people coming up to her on the corniche. The Cornish. Often she puts her hand on these people's arms to calm them down, and they do calm down, even though it's clear to Freya that Devi herself is very mad but the others do not see or feel it. It's strange to think that Devi is such a good liar. At the print shop, a big group of people are packed into a little meeting room, looking at screens and talking things over. Devi shoes Freya to her corner and with the cushions and paints and lots of building parts and the boxes, then goes over to the biggest group and starts asking questions. The printers are wonderful. They can make anything you want. Well. You can't print elements. This is one of Debbie's sayings. Mysterious to Freya in its import. But you can print DNA and make bacteria. 
You can print another printer. You could print out all the parts for a little spaceship and fly away if you wanted. All you need is the right feedstocks and designs. And they have feedstocks stored in the floors and walls of the ship and the big library of designs, which they can alter however they want. They have the whole periodic table on board. Almost. And they recycle everything they use, so they'll never run out of anything they need. Even the stuff that turns to dust and falls to the ground will get eaten by bugs that like it, and thus get concentrated until people can harvest it back out of the dead bugs. You can take dirt from anywhere in the ship and sift it for what you want. So the printers always have what they need to make stuff. But now a printer is broken. Or maybe it's all the printers at once. They aren't working. People keep saying they. They aren't obeying instructions or answering questions. The diagnostics say everything's fine, or say nothing. And nothing happens. It's more than one printer. Freya listens to the discussion for the way it sounds, trying to grasp the tenor of the situation. She concludes it is a serious, but not urgent. They aren't going to die in the next hour but they need the printers working. It's maybe just the command and control systems that are at fault. Part of the ship's mind, the AI that Devi talks to all the time. Although that's bad. Or maybe the problem is mechanical. Maybe it's just the diagnostics that have broken, failing to spot something obvious, something easy. Push the reset button, hit it with a hammer. Anyway, it's a big problem. So big that people are happy to put it on Devi. And she does not shirk to take it. She's asking all the questions now. This is why some people call her the chief engineer, although never when she can hear them. She says it's a group. Now, from the tone of her voice, Freya can tell it's going to take a long time. Freya settles in to paint a picture. A sailing ship on a lake. Later, much later, it's Badim who wakes Freya stretched out on her line of cushions and takes her to the tram station, where they tram home to Nova Scotia, three biomes away. Devi is not going to be coming home that night, nor is she home the next night. The morning after that, she is there asleep on the couch, and Freya lets her sleep, and then when she wakes, gives her a big hug. Hey girl, Devi says dully, let me go to the bathroom. Are you hungry? Famished. I'll cook scrambled eggs. Good. Devi staggers off to the bathroom. Back at the kitchen table, she eats with her face right over the plate, shoveling it in. Freya would get told to sit up straight if she ate that way, but now she says nothing. When Devi eases off and sits back, Freya serves her hot coffee and she slurps it down noisily. Are the printers working? Freya asks, feeling that now it's safe to ask. Yes, Devi says grumpily. It turns out the problems with the diagnostics and the printers have all been one problem, which only made sense. It seems a gamma ray shot through the ship and made an unlucky hit, collapsing a wave function in a quantum part of the computer that runs the ship. It's such bad luck that Devi wonders darkly if it might have been sabotage. The Dim doesn't believe this, but he's... He, too, is troubled. Particles shoot through the ship all the time. Thousands of neutrinos are passing through them right this second. And dark matter, and God knows what, all passing right through them. Interstellar space is not at all empty. Mostly empty. But not. Of course, they, too, are mostly empty, Debbie points out, still grumpy. No matter how solid things seem, they are mostly empty. So things can pass through each other without any problems except for once in a while. Then a fleck hits something as small as it, and both go flying off, or a twist in position. Then things could break and get hurt. Mostly these little hurts mean nothing. They can't be felt, and don't matter. Every body and ship is a community of things getting along, and few little things knock this way or that don't matter. The others take up the slack, but every once in a while, something bangs into something and breaks it, 
in a way that matters to the larger organism can range in effect from a twinge to death outright. It can be like one of their spoons knocking flat a house of cards. No one wants to hurt the ship, Badim says. We don't have anybody that deranged. Maybe, Debbie says. Badim's eyeballs Freya for Debbie to see, as if Freya can't see this, though of course she does. Debbie rolls her eyes to remind Badim of this. How often Freya has seen this eye dance of theirs. Well, anyway, the printers are back up again, Badim reminds her. I know, it's just that whenever quantum mechanics is involved, I get scared. There's no one in this ship who really understands it. We can follow the diagnostics and things get fixed, but we don't know why. And I don't like it. I know, Badim says, looking at her fondly. My Sherlock. My Galileo. Mrs. Fix-It. Mrs. Knows How Everything Works. She grimaces. Mrs. Asks the next question, you mean? I can always ask questions, but I'd rather have the answers. The ship has answers. Maybe. She's pretty good, I'll give her that. She's the one who caught it this time, and that was not an easy catch. Although it was in part of her. But still, I'm beginning to think that the reclusive induction we've been introducing is having an effect. The dim nods. You can see it's stronger, and it'll keep doing it. You'll keep doing it. We have to hope so. Sometime in the middle of the night, Freya wakes and sees a light is on in the kitchen. Dim and bluish. The light from their screen. She gets up and creeps down the hall, past her parents' room, where she can hear Badim faintly snoring. No surprise. Debbie up at night. She is sitting at the table, talking quietly with the ship, and part of it that she sometimes calls Pauline which is her particular interface with the ship's computer, where all of her personal records and files are cached in a space no one else can access. Often, it has seemed to Freya that Devi is more comfortable with Pauline than any real person. But Dim says the two of them have a lot in common. Big, unknowable, all-encompassing, all-enfolding. Generous to others. Selfless. Possibly a kind of folly, a uh, duh, which he explains is a French for a two-person dance of craziness. Folie a deux. Not at all uncommon. Can be a good thing. Now Debbie says to her screen, So if the state lies in a subspace of Hilbert space, which is spanned by the degenerate eigenfunction that corresponds to alpha, then the substance S-alpha has dimensionally N-alpha. Yes, the ship says. The voice, its voice in in this context is a pleasant woman's voice, low and buzzy, said to be based on Devi's mother's voice, which Freya never heard. Both Devi's parents died young, long ago. But this voice is a constant presence in their apartment. Even at times, Freya's invisible, but all-seeing babysitter. Then after measurement of beta, the state of the system lies in a space alpha-beta, which is a subspace of S-alpha, and is spanned by the eigenfunction common to alpha and beta. The subspace has dimensionally N-alpha-beta, which is not greater than N-alpha. Yes and subsequent measurement of C, mutually compatible with alpha and beta, leaves the state of the system in a space S alpha beta C. That is a subspace of S A B, and whose dimensionality does not exceed that of S A B. And in this manner, we can proceed to measure more and more mutually compatible observables. At each step, the eigen state is forced into subspace of lesser and lesser dimensionality. Until the state of the system is forced into subspace dimensionality n equals 1, a space spanned by only one function. Thus, we find our maximally informative space.
Debbie sighs. Oh, Pauline, she says after a long silence. Sometimes I get so scared. Fear is a form of alertness. But it can turn into a kind of fog. It makes it so I can't think. That sounds bad. Sounds like too much of a good thing has become a bad thing. Yes. Then Debbie says, Wait. There is a silence, and then she is in the hallway, standing over Freya. What are you doing up? I saw the light. All right. Sorry. Come on in. Do you want anything to drink? No. A chocolate? Yes. They don't often have chocolate powder. It's one of the rationed foods. Debbie puts the teapot on to boil. The glow of the stove coil adds red light to the blue light from the screen. What are you doing? Frey asks. Oh, nothing. Debbie's mouth tightens at the corner. I'm trying to learn quantum mechanics again. I knew it when I was young, or I thought I did. Now I'm not so sure. How come? Why am I trying? Yes. Well, the computer that runs the ship is partly a quantum computer, and no one in the ship understands quantum mechanics. Well, that's not fair. I'm sure there are several in the math group who do, but they aren't engineers, and when we get problems with the ship, there's a gap between what we know in theory and what we can do. I just want to be able to understand Aram and Delwyn and the others in the math group when they talk about stuff like this. She shakes her head. It's going to be hard. Hopefully it won't really matter. But it makes me nervous. Shouldn't you be sleeping? Shouldn't you? Here, drink your hot chocolate. Don't nag me. But you nag me. But I'm the mom. They sip and slurp together in silence. Freya begins to feel sleepy with the heat in her stomach. She hopes the same will happen to Debbie, but Debbie sees her put her head on the table and goes back talking to the screen. Why a quantum computer? She asks, plaintively. A classical computer with a few zeta flops would have been enough to do anything you might need, it seems to me. In certain algorithms, the ability to exploit superposition makes a quantum computer much faster, the ship replies. For factoring, some operations that would have taken a classic computer 100 billion billion years will only take a quantum computer 20 minutes. But do we need to do that factoring? It helps aspects of navigation. <sighs> Devi sighs. How did it get this way? How did what get what way? How did this happen? How did what happen? Do you have an account of how this voyage began? All the camera and audio recordings made during the trip have been kept and archived. Hmm. <laughs> Devi hoofs. You don't have a summary account, an abstract? No. Not even the kind of thing one of your quantum chips would have? No. All the chip data are kept. Devi sighs. Keep a narrative account of the ship. Make a narrative account of the trip that includes all the important particulars, starting from now, starting from the beginning. How would one do that? I don't know. Take your goddamn superposition and collapse it. Uh, meaning? Meaning summarize, I guess, or focus on some exemplary figure, whatever. Silence in the kitchen. Humming of screams, whoosh of vents. As Freya gives up and goes back to bed, Devi continues talking with the ship. Sometimes feeling Devi's fear gets so heavy in Freya that she goes out into their apartment's courtyard alone, which is allowed, and then go out into the park at the back edge of the fetch, which is not. One evening, she walks to the Cornish to watch the afternoon on shore, wind tear at the lake surface, and the boats out there scudding around, tilted at all angles, the boats tied to the dock or moored near it, bobbing up and down. 
the white swans rocking under the wall of the Cornish, hoping for breadcrumbs. Everything gleams in the late afternoon light when the sunlight flares out at the western wall, leaving the hour of twilight glow. She heads back home fast, intent to get back into the country yard, the courtyard, before Badim calls her up for dinner. But three faces appear under a mulberry tree in the little forest park behind the Cornish. Their faces half blackened by the fruit they have stuffed inaccurately into their mouths. She leaps back a bit, scared they might be feral. Hey, you, one says. Come here. Even in the twilight, she can see it's one of the boys who live across the square from them. He has a foxy face that is attractive, even in the dusk, with his stained lower face like a black muzzle. What do you want? Freya says. Are you ferals? We're free, the boy declares with a ridiculous intensity. You live across the plaza from me, she says scornfully. How free is that? That's just our cover, the boy says. If we don't do that, they come after us. Mainly, we're out here, and we need a meat plate. You can get one for us. So he knows who she is. Maybe. But he doesn't know how well the labs are guarded. There are little cameras everywhere. Even now, what he is saying might be getting recorded by the ship. There for Devi to hear. Freya tells the boy this, and he and his followers giggle. The ship isn't all knowing as that. He says confidently, we've taken all kinds of stuff. If you cut the wires first, there's no way they can get you. What makes you think they don't have movies of you cutting the wires? They laugh again. We come at the cameras from behind. They're not magic, you know. Freya isn't impressed. Get your own meat tray, then. You want the kind in the lab your dad works in. Which would be tissue for medical research, not for eating. But all she says is, not from me. Such a good girl, such a bad boy. He grins. Come see our hideout. This is more appealing. Frey is curious. I'm already late. Such a good girl. It's right here nearby. How could it be? Come see. So she does. They giggle as they lead her into the thickest grove of the trees in the park. There they've dug out a lot of soil between two thick roots of an elm tree, and down there under the deeper roots she sees by their little headlamps, they have a space that reaches up into the roots of the elm. Four or five great roots meeting imperfectly and forming their roof. There are four of them down here in the hole, and though the boys are quite small, it's just still an impressive little space. They have room to stand, and the earthen walls are straight and firm enough to hold a few squared off holes where they have put some things. You don't have room for a meat plate in here, Freya declares, or the power to run it, and the medical labs don't have the right plates for you anyway. We think they do, the fox boy says, and we're digging another room and getting a generator too. Freya refuses to be impressed. You're not Ferals. Not yet, the boy admits. But we'll join them when we can, when they contact us. Why should they contact you? How do you know they got away themselves? What's your name? What's yours? I'm Ewan. His teeth are white in his dark muzzle. She is dazzled by their headlamps. She can only see what they look at and how they're all looking at her. In the light reflecting from her, she sees a rock in one of their wall holes. She seizes it up and holds it threateningly. I'll be going home now, she says. You aren't real ferals. They stare at her as she climbs up, cut earthen steps out of the hole. Ewan reaches up and pinches her on the butt, trying for between her legs, it feels like. She swings the rock at him, then dashes through the park and away. When she gets home, Badim is just calling for her da- down in the courtyard. 
She goes upstairs and doesn't say anything about it. Two days later, she sees the boy Ewan with some adults on the far side of the square and says to Badim, Do you know who those people are? I know everyone, Badim says in his joking voice, although it's basically true, as far as Freya can tell. He peers across at them. Hmm. Well, maybe I don't. That boy there is a jerk. He pinched me. Hmm. Not good. Where did this happen? In the park. He looks more closely at them. Okay. I'll see if I can find out. They live over there, I think. Yes, of course they do. I see. I hadn't noticed. This strikes Freya as a little unlike him. Don't you like our new place? Their recent move was from Yangtze to Nova Scotia. A big move, as being from ring A to ring B. But everyone moves sometime. It's important. Keeps mixing people together. Part of the plan. Oh, I like it all right. I'm just not used to it yet. I don't know everyone here yet. You spend more time here than I do. That evening, as they eat a dinner of salad, bread, and turkey burgers at the kitchen table, Freya says, So are they really ferals? Can there be people hiding in the ship that you don't know about? But Dim and Devi look at her, and she explains, some of the kids in this town say there are ferals who live off by themselves. I figured it was just a story. Well, Badim says, it's a little bit of a controversy on the council. Badim has been serving on the ship's security council and has recently made a permanent member. Everyone is chipped at birth, and you can't get the chip out very easily. It would look like an operation. Some people may have done it anyway, of course, or managed to deactivate them. It would explain some things. What if the people, the hidden people had babies? Well, yes, that would explain even more things. Again, he stares at her. Who are those kids you've been talking to? Just ones in the park. They're just talking. Badim shrugs. It's an old story. It comes up from time to time. Anytime a security case goes unsolved, there are people ready to bring it up. I guess it's better than hearing about the five ghosts again. They laugh at this, but Freya also feels a shiver. She once saw one of the five ghosts in the doorway of her bedroom. But probably there aren't any, Badim says. It goes on to explain that the gas balance of the ship's air is so finely tuned that if there were was a feral population, it would be noticeable in the changed proportion of oxygen to carbon dioxide. Devi shakes her head at this. There's too much random flux to be sure. It's enough to disguise an extra couple dozen people, maybe more. So to her, the ferals are possible. They could throw their salts out and grab some phosphorus and get their soils back in balance in just the way we can't. No matter which way Devi sets off, no matter how they try to distract her, she always ends up in the same spot in her head, in what she calls the metabolic rifts, like a place where cracks in the floor have opened up. When Freya sees it happen, a little worm of fear awakes in her and crawls around in her belly. She and Badim share a look. They both love a person who will not listen to them. Badim nods politely at Devi. Next time the security council meets, he says, he'll mention to his colleagues that Devi feels there is no gas balance proof that ferals don't exist. And strange things do happen in the ship, so one explanation could be that people who aren't part of the official population are doing them. It's more likely, Badim jokes again, than it being the work of the five ghosts. The ghosts were supposed to be of the people who died in the original acceleration of the ship, the great scissoring. Devi rolls her eyes at this old story, wonders, how, wonders aloud how it endures for generation after generation. Freya keeps her eyes on her plate. She definitely saw one of the ghosts. It was after they took a trip up to the spine and visited one of the turbine rooms next to the reactor, when it was empty for repairs and walked among the giant turbines. That night, Freya had a dream in which the repair team forgot they were in there and locked them in. 
and the steam jetted into the big room to spin the turbines, and as they were being parboiled and cut to pieces, Freya woke up, gasping and crying, and there, in the doorway of her room, stood a shadowy figure she could see through. A man looking at her with a wolfish little smile. Why did you wake up from that dream? He asked. She said, We were going to get killed. He shook his head. If the ship tries to kill you when you are dreaming, let it. Something more interesting than death will occur. It was obvious by his transparency that he ought to know. Freya nodded uneasily, then woke up again. And as she sat up, it seemed to her that she had never really been asleep. Later she tried to decide it was all a dream, but no other dream she had ever had, had been quite like that one. So now, as Badim declares that the five ghosts would be better than Feral's, she's not so sure. How many dreams do you remember? Not just the next day, but for the rest of your life. Uh, we're going to stop there again. Uh, I think uh, 30 minutes is good for these episodes. Tell me if you want them longer or shorter. I just feel like 30 minutes is a, is a good amount of time. We're, uh, we sh we'll definitely get into chapter two at the next one. So the next episode I record should be... Um, should, should definitely be like... Uh, a pretty short one. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you have a good day. hope you have a good night. Uh, if you liked the video, leave a like. Uh, if you're out there in the world and somehow you've reached this channel by way of, you know, not my Twitch channel, then uh, I would always appreciate if you would subscribe. And... Uh, Thanks so much for watching.